welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. I want to take a minute and first say thank you to all of you, my subscribers, for joining me on this journey. And even those of you who have just come in and stopped by, thank you, welcome. In this video, we're going to continue on with the book titled Power Through Constructive Thinking by Emmett Fox. And before we jump into the next section, I'd like to give a quick highlight of some of my key points from the previous video, The Lord's Prayer. Here, the author is offering us a common sense, fresh approach to the understanding of the words of the Lord's Prayer with a bit of what I would call eyes of psychology and a twist of light science. If you are religious or not, I invite you to suspend any prejudice and venture forward with me um, with the eyes of an adventurer and an explorer of truth. So as an so, explorer, we may ask questions like, what is the Lord's Prayer and what is its origin? So, in, so we are told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 1, that the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' response to his disciples, where it, it is stated that the disciples made a request, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. We are told that Jesus responds with a slightly shorter version of the Lord's Prayer than the one that we find in Matthew's Gospel. And it seems that Bible scholars debate whether Jesus created the Lord's Prayer or not. Um, I am not a Bible scholar, and yeah, the question then is, are there any references in the Bible to how John taught his disciples? And that is an excellent question. And however, I'm not quite sure that the Bible does give us any information about how John taught his disciples to pray, only that he did teach them to pray as per that line in the book of Luke. So we do learn that John the Baptist lived in the wilderness of Judea, and he was a prophet and a preacher who prepared people for Jesus the Messiah. So the Lord's Prayer does appear in two of four of the Gospels, the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, and also the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 2 through 4. What I do want to share with you is that after reading the section uh, written by Emmett Fox on the Our Father, I have a whole new appreciation for the words and can understand how Emmett Fox would classify it as a treatment. If anything, as for me, the first two words of the Lord's Prayer encompass the law and the relationship each human has with his Creator and also with each other. Our Father is a reminder of a cosmic law that like begets like. Mm -hmm. So with that, I hope that you do go back and listen to that uh, video. And let's get ready as I turn the page to the next section. Power Through Constructive Thinking by Emmett Fox. This book is in the public domain. Section 3. The Good Shepherd. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. 3. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. 4. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 5. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. 
6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Good Shepherd A Meditation on Psalm 23 The 23rd Psalm is a spiritual treatment in the form of a poem. You should read this meditation through several times, dwelling on each statement and endeavoring to realize the significance of what you are reading. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord means God, in particular my own knowledge of truth, as that knowledge is the presence of God in me, my indwelling Christ. This is my shepherd. The shepherd takes care of his sheep, and the Lord will take care of me because I am now seeking him through this meditation. I have only to realize sufficiently this truth, that the Lord is my shepherd, and every negative thing in my life will vanish away. I shall not want. I really believe this, and I fully accept it, so I am not going to be afraid of anything. I firmly believe that I shall not want for any good thing. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Green pastures symbolize an abundance of all good things that I need and perfect all-round harmony in my life. They are to be mine permanently and forever, and not merely as a temporary demonstration. That is why I may be said to lie down in them. He dwelleth me beside the still waters. Water in the Bible symbolizes the soul. To lead me beside the still waters means that the power of God in prayer sets my soul at rest, giving me perfect peace. I know that when once my soul is at peace, my demonstration must come, and that my only task is to bring about this peace. By this meditation, I am practicing the presence of God. That is, I am praying for peace, and I know that this prayer will be answered. He restoreth my soul. This is my promise of complete salvation. My prayer is now being answered. The peace of God is filling my soul. All my difficulties have arisen from my soul, having separated herself in belief from her living source. I have thought myself to be separated from God, and therefore, for practical purposes, I was separated. And this has meant for me a load of responsibility, selfishness, fear, and a limitation. In other words, the fall of man. This text, however, definitely promises the restoration of my soul to her original divine understanding and is a guarantee of freedom. I affirm that this is now true. I claim full salvation from all my difficulties. I claim perfect health, happiness, and prosperity. I am free. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Righteousness means right thinking. And I know that to think rightly about any condition means healing and safety. All evil is wrong thought. All good is right or true thought. Christ in me, my good shepherd, is now guiding me in the path of right thought so all will be well. In the Bible, the name of anything is the nature or character of that thing. The nature of God is all-powerful, omnipresent good, boundless love. I know that this boundless love is now taking care of me and arranging my affairs. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. I am never again going to be afraid of anything, because thou, my good shepherd, art with me. 
I know that Thou, who art all love and hast all power, protectest me, and that we are one forever and forever. I know that I never can find myself anywhere, but Thou wilt be there too. I know that because Thou art life, there is no death. And I note that the Bible speaks not of death, but of the shadow of death, which is our false belief. There is no death, but the seeming loss of thy presence. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I know that thy law changeth not, because thou art divine principle, and I know that my word shall go forth in this meditation, and that it shall not return unto me void, because I am thy child and the heir of thy kingdom. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My enemies are my own thoughts, my doubts, my fears, my thoughts of criticism of others, and self-condemnation, the only enemies I can have. A man's enemies shall be those of his own household. But these now no longer have any power to hurt me because I am speaking the word of truth, and my good shepherd will bring me a glorious demonstration in the teeth of every difficulty. Thou anointest my head with oil. In the Bible, oil and ointments are symbols of gladness, praise, and thanksgiving. This line assures me that I am to be rescued from all my difficulties. Anointing with oil is also a symbol of consecration, and by meditating in this way on the truth, I am reconsecrated as the perfect child of God. I bless God for His perfect goodness. I thank God for His perfect, unceasing care for me. I praise Him for the glory of His name. I thank him, in particular, for a perfect and generous demonstration over my present difficulties. My cup runneth over. This is an additional assurance of the thoroughness and fullness of my demonstration. Not simply that God will rescue me from my difficulties, but that I am going to receive a clear, full, and all satisfying solution of my problem and of the unseen causes underlying it so that it will disappear forever out of my life. When my good shepherd replenishes my cup, it is not merely filled, it runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Because I know that Every good prayer should finish with thanksgiving and a declaration of faith. I now give thee thanks, infinite divine love, for the accomplished fact, and I praise thy glorious, unbounded perfection for the flawless harmony and peace and triumph that shall surely be mine. I affirm this triumph. I claim it. I appropriate it. It is mine. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank God that I now know indeed that the Lord is my shepherd and that I never shall want any good thing. I know it and realize it. My soul is rooted and grounded in truth. Thy presence is with me and it gives me rest. Now, no fear, no doubt can by any means creep in. I am thy child, the son of thy house, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, and in that house I dwell with thee forever and ever. It is finished. All is well. End of section. Stay right here. We're going to go ahead and flip out to the next page. In the meantime, do hit that like button, and if you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. Next section. The Secret Place 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust.
3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. 6. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. 8. Only with thine eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. 10. There shall be no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. 12. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. 16. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91 The ninety-first Psalm is one of the very greatest chapters in the whole Bible. It is one of those chapters that everybody knows by heart. Yet, like so many familiar Bible passages, it is unfortunately among the least understood. It must, of course, be interpreted in the spiritual way, and it is only thus that the true meaning is arrived at. Like the rest of Scripture, the underlying thought is developed through a series of symbols, and it is by the appreciation of the values lying behind these that the power of this prayer is appropriated. The Book of Psalms has been called the Little Bible, and it certainly forms a matchless treasure house of spiritual riches. This wonderful collection of poems, lyrical, dramatic, elegiac, contains something to fit every mood and to meet every need of humanity. All through the centuries of both Old Testament and Christian history, they have been a never-failing source of inspiration and comfort for men and women of every kind and every walk of life. And it is safe to say that no soul in need has ever turned to the Book of Psalm in vain. The 91st Psalm, when scientifically understood, is found to be one of the most powerful prayers ever written. All sorts of people have got themselves out of every conceivable kind of trouble working on this prayer every day, in the spiritual way. Other cases are on record of people who had not prayed for years turning to this prayer in some great emergency and overcoming their difficulty. With only the surface meaning to help them, it will easily be seen, therefore, how well worthwhile it is to make oneself thoroughly acquainted with at least the principal ideas contained with it, for then one has always ready to hand a practical prayer of unparalleled power. The best way to get the most out of this psalm is to read it through quietly. Pause after each clause to consider the meaning as given in the commentary. Assent to this mentally, and then pass on to the next. Remember that all this is praying. Prayer is essentially thinking about God, not necessarily addressing God, helpful though this may be at times. And while you are working on the psalm, analyzing the text, and considering the meaning in your own mind, you are praying. 
and in a very efficient way too. If you are in a specific difficulty, and particularly if you are rather fearful, you will find after working through the prayer once or twice or perhaps three times that most of your fear will have gone and that you are now looking at things from a different point of view. And this is the change in mentality that brings about results. Let us then consider the prayer in detail, taking it verse by verse. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place of the Most High is your own consciousness, and this fact is the most important practical discovery in the whole science of religion. The error that is usually made is to suppose the secret place of the Most High to be somewhere outside of yourself, across the sea, or up in the sky probably. This error is usually fatal to our hopes, because our prospects of success in prayer depend upon our succeeding in getting some degree of contact with God. And since He is only to be contacted within, and never without, as long as we are looking without, we must naturally fail in our objective. Jesus emphasized this truth again and again. Indeed, it is the foundation stone of this whole teaching. Seek first the kingdom of God, he said. And when asked where that kingdom could be found, replied, The kingdom of God is within you. And again, he said that when we pray, we are to enter into the closet and shut the door, meaning to retire in thought within our own consciousness and to withdraw our attention from outer things. In fact, this doctrine of the secret place and the wonders that can happen therein is taught right throughout the Bible. To abide under the shadow of the Almighty means to live under the protection of God Himself. Under the shadow is a dramatic oriental expression for safety. Eastern people, and especially those with a desert background, such as the people of Palestine, look upon the sun as a danger, even an enemy from which they need to be safeguarded. In the West, as a rule, we look upon him as our greatest friend, and we can hardly get enough sun to satisfy us. But in the East, it is otherwise. Their shade is sanctuary, or safety, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. The exhausted traveler, on attaining his goal, sinks down in the shade for his long-sought rest, feeling that now at last he is safe. Let us note that here God is called the Almighty. This title being selected from among the many other titles that the Bible has for God in order to impress us at this point with the fact that He really is Almighty and that He can therefore overcome our present difficulty for us, no matter how big it may seem at the moment. With God, all things are possible. Consider, however, that the promise is made to him that dwelleth. If we only run into the secret place now and again, when we are in trouble, we can scarcely be said to dwell there. God will always come to our rescue whenever we pray. But if we seldom think of him at other times, we may experience considerable difficulty in making our contact in an emergency. Or we may even be so perturbed as to forget altogether to pray. By means of regular daily prayer and meditation, we dwell in the secret place. And then we may expect to abide under the shadow and to enjoy the protection of the power that is indeed all-powerful. At this moment, we notice a change in the form of the psalm from the third person to the first. This is a literary stroke of rare skill. Observe that the poem opens by definitely announcing the irresistible power of prayer. 
It states a general cosmic law in a form of scientific detachment. In order to bring home to you with unmistakable clearness the fact that this law applies to you as much as to anything or anyone in the universe, and that by no possibility could you be an exception. It now changes over to the first person and makes you say, I. In the language of metaphysics, it compels you to voice the I am. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. The Lord means God, in particular your own knowledge of truth, as that knowledge is in itself the presence of God in the one who knows it, his indwelling Christ. How can knowledge be a presence? Secular knowledge, which is intellectual, cannot. But the true knowledge of God is not an intellectual theory. It is an actual experience, not a thing of the head, but of the heart. And this is indeed a presence. It is indeed one's own higher or real self. It is pure spirit. It is at one with God. As a general rule, people contact this real self only vaguely and occasionally at first, often calling the experience intuition. Then, if they pray regularly in the scientific way, and especially if they frequently pray for inspiration, the flickering gleams of intuition gradually magnify and strengthen into a clear and definite sense of the presence of God when he really becomes their Lord. The student should understand, however, that it is by no means necessary to get this clear sense of the divine presence in order to have the help of God. The very fact that you are praying at all means that the action of God is taking place in your consciousness and the action of God must have results. In Him will I trust. However worried or depressed you may be, however full of doubts and misgivings, still the very fact that you are praying means that you have at least enough faith for that. The faith to go on praying in the midst of doubts about results is the tiny grain of mustard seed that Jesus says is sufficient for practical purposes. In Him will I trust is an expression of your determination to trust in God in spite of appearances. It means that you have now determined to trust practically in God by ceasing to worry and fear. This is the legitimate and spiritual use of the will. Your will is a divine faculty and has its own place in the spiritual life. Of course, the will can be misused. We must not try to bring events to pass by the direction of exertion of willpower, even to produce a bodily healing. But the will must be employed to say whether we are going to pray or not to pray, whether we're going to give way to fear or to refuse to do so, whether we're going to yield to temptation or not. In the case of temptation, it is notorious how often willpower fails, but that is because the will should be employed, not to fight the temptation directly, but to choose to pray about it instead of giving way to it. This phrase means not that you have already attained a sense of security, but that though you still feel yourself to be in danger, you are choosing by the correct exercise of your power of will to put your trust in the love of God instead of in the impending danger. At this point, the poem dramatically changes again, this time from the first person to the second. You have now voiced the I am. You have recognized both the power and the goodness of God and the fact of the living presence of God in you and with you. You have determined by a spiritual act of will to trust in God. And by this procedure, you have brought the action of God into play in your life. You have done your part. Now, the word of truth is represented as addressing you with an authoritative assurance that your prayer will be answered, that in some way or other, not by any means necessarily in the way that you expect, but in some good way, you will be rescued from your difficulty. Again, the Eastern instinct for dramatic form drives the great truth home with unequal power in this employment of the second person. Surely, 
He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Needless to say, both the fowler's snare and the noisome pestilence are to be interpreted in the most general sense as including any kind of danger, material, moral, or spiritual that can threaten your welfare. And very apt descriptions they are of many of the perils that beset the children of men in their daily round. You are, however, to have no apprehension, for your protection is now assured to you in one of those beautiful illustrations from simple everyday life in which the Bible abounds. What child has not watched with delight the familiar farmyard scene in which the motherly old hen, at the slightest threat of danger, gathers the little chicks under her wings, covering them with her feathers from any possible harm? Thus does God shield you from all danger once you have elected to trust him. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. It is the knowledge of the truth about God and man that makes the demonstration. One does not do something with divine truth. It is the knowing of that truth that in itself heals the condition. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. These two verses together with verse 13, lower down, constitute a superb analysis of the rationale of man's psychological nature. The respective characteristics of our conscious and subconscious minds are contrasted with unsurpassed insight. For practical purposes, all our troubles may be classified as belonging to either the conscience or the subconscious mind and have to be dealt with accordingly. The arrow that flieth by day and the destruction that wasteth at noon refer to any difficulty of which you are consciously aware, whether that difficulty be a physical ailment, a business problem, trouble with another person, or what not. The point here is that you are aware of the difficulty and that you are seeking in one way or another to overcome it. It is, so to say, a daytime problem. The terror by night and the pestilence that walketh in darkness, on the contrary, implies something that, unknown to you, is working in your subconscious mind or unsuspected by you in the world outside of yourself. Modern psychology has shown conclusively that most of our difficulties have their roots far out of sight in the depths of the subconscious and that these subconscious minds, in fact, contain an enormous amount of material whose presence we little suspect. These are indeed terrors of the mental night and pestilences of the darkness. In a less personal sense, they refer to any danger from outside of yourself of which you may be unaware. An impending accident, for instance, would come under this heading, or any hostile activities by people secretively inimical to you. If, let us say, an enemy were covertly working against you, or, as occasionally happens, a business partner or an employee were acting to your detriment, unsuspected by you, such things would come under this heading of hidden trouble. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. This clause has been gravely misunderstood. It has been taken to indicate some kind of favoritism on the part of God, whereas, of course, such a thing is utterly impossible. No respecter of persons. It really means, quite simply, that prayer does change things, that those who pray are saved from trouble that would otherwise overtake them, and that does in fact overtake those who do not pray. The word wicked originally meant bewitched, 
and the wicked need not necessarily be conscious wrongdoers, but are much more frequently just those who do not rely upon God, or are troubled to say their prayers because they are bewitched or deceived by materialism or atheism or by simple doubt in the efficacy of prayer. Because they do not pray, they cannot expect to escape from trouble and do not succeed in doing so. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. This is one of those definite and concrete promises given in the whole Bible. In all the many declarations of the nearness and certainty of God's help, which abound in the scriptures, not one is more precise or more definite than this. It says that once you have made this divine Christ power your refuge, by living regularly in the spiritual consciousness, making it your habitation, no trouble can touch you. Could the thing possibly be more pointedly and convincingly stated? The Bible has an idiom that is all its own, and in this idiom the word promise is the name given to a statement of some metaphysical law. It is not used in the sense in which you promise a person to do something at some future date, meaning an agreement or pledge. Such a promise is supposed to be a matter of choice on the part of its author who says, in effect, I am willing to do such a thing next week or next year. I choose now to agree to do it. Thus, one may promise to pay a sum of money in six months' time, or one may promise a child to take it to a show next week. A Bible promise is a statement of a natural law in metaphysics, just as a law of physics such as Boyle's Law or Ohm's Law is a statement of the consequences upon the physical plane that will naturally follow upon certain other occurrences. So, a Bible promise is a statement of the consequences that naturally follow from certain thoughts and states of consciousness. If Boyle's Law were written in the Bible idiom, it would read something like this, As I live, said the Lord, whenever thou shalt double the pressure of a gas, thou shalt half the volume, temperature remaining constant. In the language of natural science, our Bible promise would run, by meditating regularly on the presence of God with you and directing your life in accordance with the fact you become immune from any kind of danger. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. This is one of the very loveliest of all promises in the Bible. For tender beauty, it stands alone. Reread it carefully now and ask yourself whether human language could possibly say anything more exquisite than this or promise anything more wonderful. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And it is meant for you and for me. It might have seemed appropriate that some extraordinary or exalted being should be given an escort of angels as a bodyguard to support him, to keep him in all his ways. But the Bible is the book of every man, and this promise is given to you and to me. It would be no bad thing if you made this single verse the subject of careful meditation every day for a month. If in that way you came to realize, however feebly, the real significance of this promise that you are to be in the charge of angels and safeguarded in all your ways, not merely in certain ways, but in all your ways, safeguarded for bodily health, for food, clothing, rent, and other necessaries of life, for right activity and self-expression, for congenial companionship, safeguarded from temptation and from fear as well. What a staggering difference this would make in your life. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Having sung of the invincible protection and loving kindness of God in this glorious burst of poetry, the inspired writer now restates the same idea from the scientific or psychological point of view. 
the great illumined ones who wrote the Bible under divine inspiration well knew all the teaching of modern psychology. They understood human nature as no other teachers have ever understood it, and they wrote of it in their own way as no others have ever written of it before or since. The ideas concerning the subconscious mind and the part it plays in our scheme of things, which have lately been put forward by investigators like Freud and Jung and others, novel though they appear to the modern world, were all quite familiar to the great initiates of the Bible, that is to say, the portions of these teachings which are correct, for of course there are many points at variance with fact. Moses, Isaiah, John, and the author of this psalm, for example, knew all that is to be known about the subconscious mind and the way in which it functions. They knew all about what we call complexes and neuroses, the unconscious motive, the phenomena of disassociation and splitting, and many other things too that our psychologists have not yet discovered. Here the psalmist draws a further contrast between the subconscious danger and the consciously realized difficulty as a development of verses 5 and 6. Now it is the adder and the dragon put against the lion. The lion stands for a difficulty about which we are informed, one of which we are so afraid that it seems a very lion in our path. The lion has his faults. He is indeed extraordinarily undesirable as a companion, ferocious, pitiless, quick as lightning, strong as steel. But credit he must be given for one major virtue. He is no sneak. He rushes at you in the open. You know what you have to meet and can take your measures. How different, on the other hand, is the attack of the adder or snake, for it is hidden. It creeps upon you in the dark, and ordinarily you have no sense of danger until the blow falls. You cannot fight this enemy squarely because you cannot see it. Here, of course, we again recognize subconscious trouble, and in the repeated and parallel phrase so characteristic of Hebrew poetry, the lion becomes a young or particularly vigorous lion, and the adder becomes a dragon. And this is the Bible term for what in modern psychology is called a complex. A complex is a group of ideas heavily charged with emotion and hidden away in the subconscious mind. These emotions usually have their roots in one of the great primary instincts of human nature, and this fact endows them with what is often a terribly destructive power. And here you are promised that your complexes shall be dissolved by the Christ truth, the realization of God. Utterly dissolved, completely dispersed, trampled under feet is the telling phrase employed to express their complete annihilation. There is nothing that can be done by psychoanalysis or any other form of psychotherapy that cannot be much better done by scientific prayer or the practice of the presence of God. Prayer, which is the appeal to God as distinct from any form of mere mental treatment, goes straight to the seat of the trouble, wherever it may be, without need of any direction on your part. When you pray about any specific difficulty, enough prayer will remove that difficulty by removing its real mental cause, whatever or wherever it may be, even though you do not in the least suspect the cause, or even though you may be erroneously attributing it to a, a quite a wrong cause. However deep down in the subconscious life the trouble may be, the Christ truth will find it and redeem it. He descended into hell. The last three verses constitute the final stanza. They are in themselves a glorious psalm of ringing joy and triumph. Even when used alone, they form a complete and wonderful spiritual treatment. Here, once more, we find a dramatic change in the presentation, with the object of compelling you to voice the I am on the highest note. Thus, your simple prayer gradually develops into nothing less than the Logos, the creative word of God, spoken through you. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. 
And this is one of those gnomic sayings in which the Bible abounds, where an ocean of teaching is crystallized into a phrase. It is a definite statement that you are to be delivered from your difficulty because you have set your love upon God. That definitely and simply. There is nothing hypothetical or contingent here. No conditions, whatever, either expressed or implied. The statement indicates the accomplished fact, the fixed decision, as it were. I will deliver him. And why? Because he hath set his love upon me. But alas, you may say, this cannot apply to me because, to be honest, I do not really feel any very strong sense of love for God. How should I like to? But I do not. To which the answer is that your love for God is not an emotion. It has really nothing to do with the feelings at all. In these matters, emotion is too often misleading. We demonstrate and prove our love for God by praying and by refusing to recognize error as having any power over us. By declining out of loyalty to God to accept anything less than the perfect harmony which is His will. If you love me, keep my commandments. By the very fact that you have been praying about a difficulty, going through this psalm, for instance, you have been setting your love upon God, no matter how depressed or how doubtful you may have felt. And therefore, he will deliver you. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. In the Bible, the name of anything means the nature or character of that thing. Now the nature of God is perfect, omnipresent, all-powerful, good, boundless love. And to know this is to be set on high above all your difficulties, that is, to be taken out of them into freedom, security, and happiness. This is because, in biblical language, to know a thing is not a mere intellectual apprehension, but involves a certain degree of understanding and realization. So we see that when we have, through our prayers, attained some real appreciation of the allness of God, our troubles disappear. The last two verses gather up, so to say, all the implications and promises of this most wonderful stanza, and present them to the fearful or doubting heart as a song of triumph, promising counsel and guidance in perplexity salvation in trouble, and a long and joyous career, culminating in complete spiritual triumph. He shall call upon me, and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. End of section. If you haven't done so, please be kind and hit that like button. The algorithm actually likes that. I hope that you do too. All right, and let's head over to the next video as I continue sharing with you this beautiful book titled Power Through Constructive Thinking by Emmett Fox.